Uh, my name is Vicky Frenzinelli. I'm soon going to be 70, so that gives you an idea of um, where I stand and how old I was at the time. I'm going to talk about different aspects. One is the legal framework, um, and then what the country was like, why was equality and not difference, um, and what did we learn in terms of the laws and within the movements. Okay? If you go back to Italy um, in the uh, late 60s, uh, beginning of the 70s, it was a very different country from what it is now. Very different. Um, and it wasn't only different in terms of women, but obviously that's, I'm be talking about the gender aspect in particular. But it was very different in terms of work. You needed a permit to move and leave your city of birth. Um, there was an overlap of many, many of the fascist laws had not been repealed yet. Um, so technically at the time, for instance, um, abortion was still a crime against the integrity of the Aryan race, uh, and so on. All right? So it was a very different country. And women were subjected um, to the basically the male order completely legally I'm talking about. I'm not talking about culture here, I'm talking about laws, meaning that adultery or leaving the home was a crime for a woman. There was no divorce, there was no contraception, there was no abortion, uh, and if at the moment of the birth of the child, the doctors, which is not a problem now, but was then, had to choose between the life of the mother and the life of the child, they had to, by law, choose the life of the child because the child was a pure soul. In other words, the prevalence of the Roman Catholic Church was extremely strong still at the time, which it is not now. Okay? So that's the starting point, which is very important. One also forgets, at least my generation forgot, we sort of felt post-war. In fact, uh, we 1968 is just over 20 years after the end of World War II, all right? And it should not be forgotten that although Italy has rewritten its history, it was a fascist country and it sided with Adolf Hitler. So that was the picture. And when you say 20 years, I realize that your age are a lot, but it simply means that somebody who was 20 was only 40 when 1968 uh, came, all right? Because that's what 20 years do to people. So the first of the many legal, I saw the first aspect will be legal to give you a framework. The first of the legal battles was for divorce because divorce was illegal in Italy. So much so that they made movies about it. There was the famous, famous Italian divorce movie where he kills his wife because he wants to marry someone else. Um, it, the divorce was illegal. You could go through the Roman Catholic Church, if you were a Roman Catholic, and ask for the marriage to be annulled. If the marriage was annulled, the children became illegitimate immediately, because annulling a marriage means that the marriage never existed. Okay, so it was a very complicated situation. There was then, that was on the 1st of December, 1970, when the law on divorce was approved. And in, at that time in Italy, there were some non-religious parties in the center-right, with the Liberal Party and the Socialist Party, which was in the center-left. The Communist Party was then the biggest uh, opposition party to the Christian Democrats, and they were very ambivalent. Uh, as to whether they should well, promote or not what was known as civil rights. Um, then there was a referendum in 1974 for the abolition of the law on divorce. You need to gather 500,000 signatures in Italy to call for a referendum. And it was called in 1974, but the people who uh, were wanting to abolish the referendum um, lost it. Uh, so, or to abolish, sorry, the law on, uh, on divorce lost it. The, it was quite a hilarious period because by then there were women moving and other things 
and some of the people who were against divorce were saying, if you approve the law on divorce, your wife will run away with another woman. I mean, it was all uh, that. That was the sort of level. Uh, and they will take your children. Um, then contraception was legalized. So contraception was illegal. Any form of contraception except for condoms. Condoms were considered legal because they were not sold as contraceptive, but to avoid men getting those terrible diseases that women give them. Okay, so they were known as prophylactics, and um, they were only sold to avoid the spread of terrible diseases from the terrible women to men. Uh, in uh, 1975, in January 1975, we have the verdict of the Constitutional Court that says that if the woman's life is in danger, it is possible to um, have an abortion. But the woman's life has to be in danger. In 1975, uh, also, but in July, planning centers, known as the Consultori no 405, were introduced, and the new family law was approved in May 75. Now, I'll dwell a moment on the new family law before I move on to the others. The new family law was really the result of the work of, um, of the previous generation of women. It was not the work of my generation of women. It was something that the women in Parliament had been working on since the Second World War. Well, since after the Second World War, when Italy became a republic. Um, the, it was also the biggest shift of money from um, men to women that Italy had ever or has ever had. I'll give you an example. Um, in the past, um, women inherited only life use of the property and only the children inherited. Okay? Generally, we bury the men because they marry younger women, because um, we live longer. So there are more widows than widowers. The only thing that will increase the number of widows is childbirth death. So once women stop dying of childbirth, which happens at the beginning of the 20th century, there are many more widows than widowers. Okay? So many more women whose husband have died has died rather than men who survived their wives. Uh, men also die more in wars. Uh, men die more because of illnesses and because genetically they, they die more. Um, so women start inheriting more money. They inherit a part. In Italy, you cannot decide, like Britain or the United States, who you leave your money to. You can only leave a quarter of your estate, which is called the disponibile, to whoever you want. The rest goes to the surviving spouse and to the children or only to the children if there is no surviving spouse. So this means that women cannot be thrown out of their house, the children cannot sell it without their consent, and this is very important because it changes the financial situation of women um, who remain without a spouse. It also changes the law on the inheritance of pensions. So women get more pensions. Now, this it also means that as get, get, putting it together with the law of divorce, that you can actually leave the house without committing a crime. You can leave the house where you lived, where your children lived, and you're a free agent. You can actually live in two different houses, you and your spouse, even without divorcing. All this is extremely important because there is no freedom if you cannot decide what you're going to do with your life. The other part of these decisions was abortion. Uh, abortion... Italy had a very, very high rate of abortion. 
And one of the reasons was, if you remember, I said that contraception was not legalized until 71, and family planning centers um, started in 1975. So there were many, many, many abortions, and many were backstreet abortions. Um, then, in 1978, Law 194 was approved, and that was the law on abortion. Again, there was a referendum to abolish it, which the people, which the Catholic Church lost. Um, there had been an event which was called Seveso, where there was a release of dioxin, which is a very powerful poison, from a factory, and the children were all born with a hair lip and many were also born with problems in their palate and anus. And the church held a meeting in a stadium saying that they would not allow abortions. And that was just before the referendum, and that would certainly change the situation. So that's as far as family rights and rights on your body, legal rights, are concerned. In 1977, so I go back a year, uh, the law on equality at work was approved. The law on equality at work meant that, with very few exceptions, you were not allowed to say whether you wanted to employ a woman or a man. For example, that was true in the railways, it was true in the judiciary, everything. You could say whether you wanted a man or a woman, for example, in performances, all right? You could say, I want to have a theater piece and I want to have a woman playing a part of a woman and a man playing a part of a man. You can also specify that you want somebody of a certain religion if it's for a religious <coughs> newspaper. But otherwise, you cannot specify it. Um, so, the law on equality was approved in 77. The law on equal opportunities was approved in 2006, and I'm sure that that will be mentioned later uh, by Carlotta. But uh, there's one thing I want to say about it. The principle, the law of equal opportunities, presumes that you would have an equal distribution unless there is discrimination. Um, and the law on equality presumes that there are differences, but you're not allowed to introduce them. But they're two completely different principles. Uh, and the law of equal opportunity derives from chapters five of the uh, civil rights uh, legislation of the United States. It's not of Europe. It, it was absorbed by Europe, but it's not of European legal origin. And then, as Carlotta will talk about later, later years saw the laws on um, sexual harassment and all the laws that introduced various other things, uh, like equal opportunity officers, etc. So that's more or less the legal framework we're, when we're talking about. Any questions on the legal framework before I move on? And, what did, and was what I said clear? There's one question. Can you can you see him? I can't hear. Can you Hi. just uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. in the first uh, chair? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah. Uh, my name is Jesus, and I'm from Spain. Right. Nice to meet you. Uh, my question is, how many of these laws are still uh, active, or in which way has things changed uh, now? All of them. Nice. <laughs> um, the, all of them, but as I mentioned, the 1977 law on equality at work was modified by the, by the 2006 legislation on equal opportunities. Otherwise, abortion law stands, the new family, it was called the new family law, the 1975 law stands, uh, the planning centers, which became regional because all the health service was regionalized. So as a result, 
they became regional, but that's the only change there has been. Contraceptives are still legal, divorce is still legal. They're talking about changing the law of divorce. I think some things have been slightly changed in terms of the length of the period of separation that you have to have before you can apply for divorce. Thank you. Not at all. Um, so, what happens in terms of the, this, this is, uh, as I say, many of these laws, not all, because the law on abortion was more the result of the feminist movement and open its activities, um, the, and, but many of the laws that we're talking about like new family law and contraceptives were really something we owe to the generation before mine. Bear in mind that uh, in Italy, there was something called the delitto d'onore, which means uh, the um, crime of honor, which meant that honor killing, if you, the man, who, if he killed a woman of his family, um, it, anyone, meaning a sister, a mother, a wife, uh, an aunt, a cousin, um, he got a very light sentence because his honor as a man had been um, touched or damaged or something. Um, I'm just checking here exactly when it was abolished. Um, it was abolished on the 5th of September, 1981. Which means that in Italy till 1981, um, a man could um, kill a woman of his family if he thought that his honor had been um, affected. And also, it eliminates the same day another law was eliminated, which was the fact that if a rapist married the victim, the, there was no crime, because there was no rape in marriage. So if a man raped a woman and then married her the day after, um, uh, there was no crime. Uh, and uh, there is a woman we owe a lot to in this respect called Franca Viola. She was a Sicilian woman and she was raped by a local minor Camorra man, mafia man in Sicily, and she refused to marry him, so he went to jail because the woman had to agree to the, to the marriage. Many women agreed to the marriage because they had lost their honor. Okay? Um, and she refused it. And, um, and by refusing it, he went to jail. So, it was the beginning of the women's movement was twofold. It was called Second. We had a, in Italy a suffragette movement which was not as strong as the suffragette movements in the Anglo-Saxon countries, but it had, there had been a suffragette movement um, be, between the two wars, between World War I and World War II. They wanted votes for women. Women got the vote in 1948 in Italy with the Republic. So quite late. Um, and um, the thought of feminism that developed in the late 60s and 70s had two different origins. One were women only groups, and one were groups of women that belonged to the extreme left, called the non parliamentary left or extra parliamentary left. And then there was a third part which were, which wasn't what we didn't call a feminist movement, but which were the old women's movements. That is to say, the organizations such as the UDI, the UDI, that belong to the Communist and Socialist Party, who we have to thank for the first of the laws that I'm listing. Many of these women had been, women had been partisans, and then they, when they, the war finished, they were basically sent home. Um, so, the, all these women's groups mix in some way, or at least meet. Um, the, many of them were attached, as I said, to parties. Many of them were separatists, meaning they met with women only and would not participate in mixed organizations. And all of this, this was the sort of um, texture, the fabric 
of what became the women's movement. It was a movement mainly at the beginning, except, so it changed around about the late 80s, beginning of the 90s, for equality and not for difference. It was a movement that did not respect the culture of the country, because the culture of the country was still prevalently a very um, male-oriented culture, a very, um, what should I say, um, like, we want to change the world and keep the women where they are, sort of culture, you know that? Um, and so the prevalence of the movement, the prevalence, not all, the separatists wanted difference already. Um, were women who wanted equality, were women who went to women who were wearing headscarves in the south and saying, take them off. This is ridiculous. You shouldn't cover your head. Um, you shouldn't uh, obey your husband. Um, I remember even in later years doing something very simple. I was holding a course for the women of the trade unions. I'll explain why. But we were holding courses for women of the trade unions. And uh, I gave them a very simple exercise. These were women mostly in their 40s, so they had children. And we're talking about 1990, maybe? 1980, 1990. And I said, when you go home, instead of first serving the other people, and traditionally you serve the men, the children, and then the women, I said, serve yourself first and don't serve anyone else at table. You eat the best piece. Don't give the best piece of meat to a man or to a child. Eat it yourself, sit down and eat. And no one could do it. The, the week after I said, you know, and that is one of the reasons, by the way, why more women die in families. There's a very interesting study uh, by an economist called Sen. Women die more in famines because when it is, when there is a lot of food, it's not a problem. You can eat lard. When there's not enough food, you die. Okay? So, it's, it's a very interesting, um, I think, thing. How long have I still got? Uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. If you want. So, this is what we have in Turin, where I live and where I live most of the time, the women's movement, unlike Milan and Rome, was very close also to the women of the trade unions. And that is why, for instance, we had things like um, courses on women and health, in which we taught self-examination and things for about 1,500 women a year. So 1,500 women a year from factories, using a law that was called Cento Cinquanta Ore, which still exists, whereby people from big workplaces could ask for 150 hours to study a year. And they used, we, we organized that. That was not true in Rome or Milan. Milan was more a politics of difference, as I mentioned the groups. Um, Rome was a bit of a mixture. We also organized before, the, before 1975, when the family planning centers were uh, made legal, we organized family planning centers and we performed abortions. We performed abortions until 1978, when they became legal and then we stopped. Uh, we performed abortions either in, in the city, there was a network of us, either in um, Turin, Lan, Rome, many, many cities, big cities, not small cities. Um, and either we performed it in uh, the women's houses, but we also sent, for example, from Turin, we also sent a plane full of women uh, to London, where it was legal every week. Um, so it was an incredible level of organization. Moving now to the aspect of organization, there was a lot of talk of how you organize. Do you organize horizontally? Do you organize vertically? 
Do you organize with um, a person who represents you? Do you organize yourself with a person who doesn't represent you? Well, no. You don't organize yourself with a person who doesn't represent you. We, um, because there was no formal structure, uh, which I think, with hindsight, um, was quite wrong, uh, happened in some cities like Turin, uh, the, the stronger women became the leaders and there was no means to control it because there was no formal process, because there was no recognition, because we were all the same. Since we're not all the same, the result was that the stronger people, the stronger personalities, the people who uh, emerged um, and were not in any way checked. Uh, Milan had developed something called um, that, that you would uh, entrust yourself to uh, a, a, a woman who was more powerful. We didn't like that in Turin. Um, Rome was a bit of a mixture. Rome is also the capital city, and as I expect in many of your capital cities, there was more political politics going on because that's where the decisions um, are made. This thing in Milan was called affidamento, and you were supposed to entrust yourself. I personally never entrusted my own decisions to anyone whatsoever. So uh, I wasn't very favorable to that. Um, there was also a lot of what was called self-awareness, they were called gruppi di coscienza. Some were good and some weren't. You were talking about yourself and how you reacted. Some were very good and sometimes they were very good and sometimes they were a bloodshed because um, again, there was no structure to it which is an advantage in one way. Bear in mind that in those days there was also no social media. There was, you know, so everything happened with people, not through the internet. Um, and so sometimes they were a bloodbath because um, a person would be criticized and criticized for what they did. Other times they were very good and very liberating. So I think that if you have a less structured form, uh, you have a different good and bad side as opposed to a structured form. You have a very different one because um, uh, you can have a great creativity, but on the other hand, you can also have many blood parts. So that depends really a lot. There were enormous demonstrations. Some of the demonstrations were also with the older women, uh, because in those days I was one of the younger women, uh, and uh, others were not. Um, there was also, don't forget, um, that there was, we had the years of terrorism in Italy. And that was very complicated. Partly because some of the terrorist group attacked family planning centers, because they had this idea that um, um, that was a way to control proletarian women, and so they would attack, physically attack family planning centers. Um, there were women terrorists. Um, if you disagreed with them, for example, we occupied a hospital in Turin to force the hospital to, uh, to implement the law on abortion, because some of the hospitals were viewed. And we were occupied in this hospital, and um, at one point, we denounced, meaning we said, these doctors, so doctor one, two, and three don't want to perform abortions, so and the law says you have to. And one of them was shot the day after. This happened twice. And uh, that means you have to assume the responsibility that what you're going to say may lead to, sh to shooting. So I remember I was at the desk with, with another three women, and I pointed to a woman whom I really thought belonged to Rimalini and, or, and another one who belonged to the Red Brigades, and I said, are you guilty? And they said, until the bourgeois state doesn't prove that we're guilty, we're innocent. And I said, the occupation is finished, because you cannot take that moral responsibility on. So you, the, the, the effect, the impact of terrorism is disastrous on the extreme left and on the women's movement, not on the separatist part, separatist part but on the other part it was. Um, so if I have to um, look back, I would say, well, 
Certainly the women's movement changed Italy, or Italy changed the women's movement. You can see it in, you know, the world changes. Um, I, I think that uh, there have been many step backwards. For example, uh, immigration, but Carlotta may talk about that later, reintroduced prostitution and housework, uh, domestic housework. Prostitution, not that it didn't exist, but prostitutes had organized and it was different. The arrival of many poor women um, who, who traveled maybe half the world to wash some people's hats um, meant that the domestic work was reintroduced in middle class family with a vengeance and that there was no longer any discussion of the division of labor between men and women because you had a woman who would come from 5,000 kilometers to wash your knickers. Um, so why, why worry about it? For a very reasonable price, which meant that even the lower middle class could afford it. So, uh, as always, all these things mix and intersect. Any questions? I'm quite happy to. The 10 minutes are up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's an interesting question. I'm born in Bulgaria, but I live and work in Croatia for the last five years. And right. here I'm representing our organization, Documenta, that is together with UP, uh, with LAPS is organizing this event. So I'm yeah. extremely happy that you're here with us today. And I wanted to ask you if you are willing to share with us um, some more sentences about what it was like for your movement to actually perform abortions, because it reminds me of this documentary called Jane. I don't know if... Oh yes, we worked with Jane. I met Jane. They married. Yeah. Yes, so maybe you can also explain to uh, our colleagues a bit of the context. I don't know if uh, you've seen this, uh, this... I haven't seen the documentary, but I know Jane. I knew the people. Okay, so could you, could you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, that's okay. There was... Um, first of all, where did we learn abortions? Well, there was the MLAC in France, M-L-A-C. The MLAC was the practical organization of Choisir. Choisir did the things for the law and MLAC performed abortions. In Italy, some women from the radical party had learned how to perform abortions. We performed them with the Carmen method, with a cannula, plastic cannula, and a reverse bicycle pump. It was very simple. We only did them up to eight weeks. Then I personally had traveled to the United States and to Britain. In the United States, there was a group called Jane, and it was called Jane because you telephoned and you said, is Jane there? And if Jane was there, uh, then they put you in contact with somebody who would perform an abortion. Again, instead of using a curette, we, they also used uh, aspiration, which was much less traumatic. Um, how do we perform abortions? Well, we, the, the consultory, that's the family planning centers that the self managed every week. I can tell you about Turin, but it was roughly the same in Milan and in Rome. Um, then we would meet. The women from the, the family planning centers, because the group that performed abortions did not go to the family planning centers. The, the groups that were in the family planning centers would say, for example, we have five women who need abortions. And we would say, how many of these uh, can um, uh, travel? Because not a lot of women had passports, and you needed passports in those days to travel. So how many can go to London? And how much money have they got? Because London, we, we bargained a good price, because we were good customers. We were sending a plane load a week. Um, and, um, uh, so we worked that out, and then there were, say, three, four women who could not travel. Right. We would see, we, the, the gynecologist from the family planning centers would see them, would not perform the abortion, would see them. We would, form the, we would perform the abortion, and then the woman would go back to a gynecologist a week after. The understanding, if there were ever a problem, we would take her to the hospital, and we would go to jail. Uh, that, 
I was lucky, it never happened to me, but that was what we did. The women from the radical party instead sometimes would call a journalist. They had a completely different attitude. Um, the, we didn't charge women anything, but if they gave money, it would go towards the women who were leaving on the plane. Um, it was, you know, in those days, for example, you needed about two weeks before you got a pregnancy test that would tell you whether you were late or really late or pregnant, because it was all different, obviously. Uh, medication was different. So, I answered your question. Yes, thank you. I'm just thinking that uh, we are very, very lucky to have you today. And, um, we can't even hear you. We're very... We're very lucky as a group to have you today and uh, also as women and girls to have you uh, talk to us about that. I think it's very important to, to be free to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I would never consider having an abortion being lucky. But <laughs> Not in that sense. Unlucky. But for example, we, we had some ideas like we did not want general anesthetics, but only local anesthetics. Because we thought, well, first of all, because the risk of a general anesthetic was much bigger than, than the risk of having an abortion. So we couldn't do it. We, we were performing it on a, on a, on a table. Um, so, but, but you know, before us, the illegal abortions in Italy were performed as follows. A knitting needle. You pierced, you put a knitting needle inside your uterus. Not us, not the women's movement. This was the illegal abortions before the women's movement. And you hoped that the fetus would die and um, form an infection, and that the infection would kill the fetus before it killed the mother. Uh, parsley or celery sticks, again, up your uterus, hoping the same thing. So women who had a lot of money would go to a doctor who would do it privately and illegally. But because it was illegal and the doctor could be struck off the next day, none of the doctors, not, none of us are doctors, um, the, the doctor charged a lot of money. Women with a lot of money could also go to Switzerland, Holland or Britain, where abortions were legal. Thank you so much. And just to finish, I, I meant lucky in the sense that we are lucky to live in a time where we have freedom and we have choices. And I think it's in a very large extent to the efforts that you had before. So, yeah. Thank you. Maybe, and uh, maybe the time would come. And uh, I also think that we underestimate the power of population policies. In those days, there were lots of babies. Now there aren't. So there will be a reaction, I believe, in a few years against abortion because of that. There's another question. Hello, I'm Gina from Bulgaria. I'm a journalist and an actress. Uh, so I want to ask you, what is the best way for uh, people uh, to for the victim, for the domestic violence. I can hardly hear you. Could you speak closer? Yes, yeah, yeah. What is the best way for the victim of uh, the domestic violence to share that? Is it uh, through media nets or uh, through a psychologist or uh, what is your uh, researchers about that? I, I think the lot is going to be talking about that. Okay. So, the first part of the movement, I would simply say what happened in the period before the 1990s. The only thing we helped women who were victims of domestic violence and who recognized it, because a lot of women in the 60s and 70s thought it was normal. They did not class it domestic violence. It was normal for a man. So, but the ones who reacted against it was to find lawyers. We found women lawyers who would help them. But things have changed a lot, and I'm sure Carlotta will talk about it. But I think that what happened in our day was making it not normal. Because if you consider it acceptable that a man will hit you, then you don't report it. Why would you? Um, you know, 
I always say, so quality is the best thing that can happen to a woman, but it's the worst thing that can happen to a man. So a man, it will, at least in my lifetime, I don't think we're going to see a world where men serve women. Uh, and I don't know if it would be a good idea, but I do know that women have served men for 2,000 years, that's for sure. Wouldn't be bad, at least for a month a year. But, <laughs> you know, it's like if you want coffee in bed, you either have to be very, very rich, or you have to have a wife that um, will, uh, will do it for you, or maybe in a world of equality, a day each. Hello, hi, uh, my name is uh, Alicia, uh, I'm Italian. And uh, I wanted to ask you maybe something more about uh, the connections, at least in doing, between uh, um, women's movement and, uh, and workers' movement. Because I feel like today we tend to, um, to, to separate a lot. So if we have, for example, a protest, we try to, you know, to maybe to fix it as a, a, a women protest. But it's very difficult, I feel, today to bring together these like, uh, different elements of, of people, you know, that is a woman, a worker, and so on. So if you can maybe tell us more about this uh, you know, connection at um, the time. We weren't, as my generation was not very identitarian. You, your generation, I believe, is very identitarian. So it makes it very difficult for people to work together because they're different identities. Um, but I may be wrong, I, I don't know. In Turin, we had this very particular experience, which was called Sindacato Donna. And Sindacato Donna had women from all the unions, CGL, Chisel, Wheel, and that, and which was necessary because if you wanted to have things like the permits for the Cento Cinquanta for the 150 hours for courses and that, you had to have it. Also, we tried some joint negotiations um, in, in the 90s, we started some joint negotiations um, on uh, sexual harassment at work uh, with the men of all the unions going, oh, they will use this against the men of the unions, you know, this will be terrible. They will use it to sack us. And we said, well, you know, if you behave properly, it won't happen. So um, it was... Uh, it was a lot of it, and then there was the, what was called the extra parliamentary left, and that was also a melting pot. Uh, but I think the main thing is that if you have um, a very strong identitarian connotation, so you maybe don't know who you are, but you know what you are, um, it becomes very difficult. Uh, to blend people together. Also, in those days, the trade unions were much stronger and there was less precarious work. And when you spoke about migrants in the 70s, there were people from southern Italy traveling to northern Italy. They weren't people from other countries. So it was very different. I, I don't know if I can answer more about that. I mean, I remember in other countries of Europe, for example, um, in Britain, there was a lot of organizing um, around um, uh, black workers and women workers. And uh, in America, there was NOW, which was the National Organization of Women that was a labor coalition. Um, Germany was not so good. Um, we didn't, in those days, we didn't know much about what was called Eastern Europe, so, you know, uh, that was sort of another world. Um, and uh, France, there were women um, working also with, within the trade unions. Then the political parties had women's caucuses. They were called Commissioni Feminini, and they were women's caucuses, uh, both the communists and the socialists and the Christian Democrats had women's caucuses. So, that was, I don't know if that has answered, though, um, your question. The, the big change was also in 77, when, before 1977, unemployment lists were separate. There was a women's unemployment list and a men's unemployment list. 
So, for example, a factory like Fiat in Turin would only call men. From 1977, they were united, and so 600 women shot to the top because they hadn't been called. And so Fiat put them in the foundries, saying, you want equality? We'll give you equality. And they put them in the foundries. And a lot of women stuck to it. They decided they were going to keep it up. And that was a moment in which the women's movement in Turin and the, and the um, workers' movement met. Now, nobody gets employed from the unemployment lists. The trade unions aren't so strong. Um, you know, and um, it's, it's very different. And there were no... Um, it was very different, different work. Work was different. There was no, not all this precarious work that it's called. Super. Thank you very much. Not at all. So, hi. Uh, I'm Blanca. I know um, Sarah already told something about me, but uh, I'm 36, so unfortunately I don't have all the interesting things to uh, say that Vicky uh, has, but uh, what uh, I would like to try with you today is to uh, trace some lines between what happened uh, in the 70s and in the 80s, where uh, what we keep talk, we keep talk to us about, uh, and what's happening now, but also what are the um, you know roots of today's movement in those kinds of movements. Starting from, I think, an interesting, for me at least, a positive point of view that is, in Italy, feminist movement was called that feminist movement of the late 60s and 70s was called the only successful revolution of the 70s. Um, and I don't know if we will agree of the fact that it was fully successful in terms of the ambitions and the goals that, that women had, but it's true that that movement completely reshaped uh, Italian society and the relationship between uh, genders. And so in, the, in this sense, uh, it, it was successful because as Vicky showed, it changed, changed the laws, mostly, <laughs> a lot of very relevant laws, but also it changed the way in which people behave every day. So we didn't um, achieve gender equality, <laughs> not at all. We are full of problems, but that kind of movement, more than many other movements of that period, really uh, put a strong mark on Italian society, and this is, for me, very relevant, and I'm very thankful, as you said. Um, so, uh, I start where like, Vicky left, in some sense, uh, with another very important law. I will start with the law, too, and then try to uh, broader a bit uh, our um, So in 1996, uh, and I stress 1996, so basically yesterday, um, Italy got a um, law uh, against rape that for the first time in Italian history uh, defined and defines today rape as a crime against one person and not, as, is, as it was before, a crime against uh, uh, morality, public morality. So, as Vicky said, uh, after the Second World War, a lot of law changes, the constitution changed, but the penal laws, so the crime laws, didn't really change. And so, we, uh, for instance, rape was regulated the fight to rape was regulated by law that was uh, really designed and written during fascism. And so what, what was rape? Rape was an act against public morality and decency. Uh, and so it was considered rape only when it happens to a girl or a woman that decide to denounce it publicly. So you know, showing in the public morality that something happened. And that's why also, for instance, marital rape was not considered rape, 
because it happens inside houses, in the privacy of the couple, and I'm quoting um, the uh, parliamentary members from a uh, Christian Democrat uh, Party, that in the privacy of your bedroom, uh, there is no rape. Why? Also because uh, till uh, 1981, in Italy there were something called marital duties. So if you said yes in the day of the marriage, then it's yes forever to what you should perform, that is sex. Uh, sex to have babies mostly, but sex. Uh, and so um, that's why also if the rapist, as Vicky told, if the rapist proposes to marry the girl and the girl accept, uh, the victim and the victim accept, then the rape disappears because then it's just sex uh, that offends no public morality at all. Because it's sex, okay, maybe we can say you have to wait after marriage, but at the end it's sex inside a couple between two people that we consent to. If you uh, understand there were no idea of consent in the law and also was fully considered rape just only penetration uh, the other things all the other things that the horrible things that you can imagine was considered acti di libidine that is libidinous act I will translate that were uh, charged but in a very, very, very light way, because what is uh, relevant is, is only penetration. Um, so uh, it was a very horrible law, as you can imagine, that uh, really forced women also in trials, in courts, to expose all the details of the violence to prove that there were penetration and mm, basically food it's better to have a better result to be, um, to be, you know, uh, just to understand that as a rape. So, um, it's interesting though that for many, many years, like until 1996, uh, rape was considered some a crime against public morality. That is something I want to stress because it's really relevant to understand also how it's perceived sexual harassment and violence even nowadays in Italy. So that is something that offends the society but that has slightly to do with you as a person, as a single person. So back in the 70s, uh, this kind of law was really uh, high <laughs> against because it was horrible. Uh, and so in 1977, uh, um, start, the feminist movement started a big campaign, a public campaign against this law to propose a reform bill that they proposed um, out of uh, what is called Legge di Iniziativa Popolare. So uh, in Italy you can uh, write the laws in the parliament or by referendum or people that write law and collect a lot of signatures and a lot of supports and can present directly to the parliament and this was the case. The feminist movement got uh, the support of some parties but mostly was really something grassroots that really starts from the people. And what kind of uh, law they proposed, it's a law that is very similar to what we uh, have 20 years after though. It's uh, a law that presents as rape any sexual act without consent, so not only penetration, and this was something very, very relevant because during the late 60s and the 70s, the feminist movement really, really uh, reshaped the way in which we understand sexuality. So um, there is this very famous book that was very famous back then uh, by Carla Lonzi, that is one of the most prominent feminists uh, in Italy, uh, that is called Vaginal Woman and Clitoridian uh, Woman, in which she proposes the idea that the, the, very, the true sexual <laughs> organ of the woman is the clitoris and not the vagina, because there is where the pleasure is and that all this sexuality, the we, uh, women's sexuality was, uh, you know, uh, killed and uh, put, uh, not visible because it 
all our sexuality is intended for the male pleasure and so the penetration uh, and the male orgasm and so the idea that there is a link between orgasm and reproduction that women do not. So uh, she, pre she presented women's uh, sexuality as uh, more free and more open and that we led to different uh, understanding of we as women in general. And this also opened up uh, an interesting, and I will not really talk about this now, but then we can talk in the uh, debate, an interesting reflection on lesbian uh, sexuality. Um, that was another of the topics that really divided the movement back then and somehow even nowadays. But, so, the first thing was to understand as sexual acts all the acts and not only the penetration that was really, really relevant. Then mandatory persecution. So the idea that you have to persecute the crime even if the woman involved, the victim, will not go public uh, to denounce it. This was a very, very, very controversial point that really divided the feminist movement back then and still now because for, what, for a part of the feminist movement this point was really necessary to, um, to really avoid the fact that women were supposed to go to police station, denounce it, and then go in court and be there and put their bodies up front. But for another part of the movement, this was really risky because it will, uh, you know, in some sense, deny the agency of women in the possibility to say when they want to uh, call out a break or when they want not to denounce it and where they want to do it. Um, but what is interesting also is that this, this was the point that had more uh, forced against it by the parties in Parliament and for instance the Christian Democratic Party, but not only, we have to say, said that this was very risky because it will put the law inside the marriage and uh, violate the privacy of uh, the uh, married couple because they were imagining like mothers-in-law saying, oh, my daughter was raped by you because they were going inside the bedrooms of the newly mm, uh, married guys and try to understand what's happening and using the sex as a fight for other situations. Really, I would say science fiction, but <laughs> still. And then the, the third point of the blow was that the trials uh, must be open to the public and also that the feminist associations could be part of the trials, so uh, be uh, involved in that. That why this? Because our uh, trials for rape were horrible and still are. Um, in Italy, the first uh, public trial for rape was in 1976 in Verona. That is interesting because Verona is a very fascist and conservative and Catholic uh, city. Mm, I did my PhD there. <laughs> um, and a girl, a 16 years girl, was raped out in the street by a group of men. So, uh, quite horrible um, situation. And she decided not only to denounce it, that, also, that was not so, uh, you know, uh, obvious, <laughs> but also to call feminist movement. She, dis she was, was a part of the feminist movement. Of course, she was very young, so she was interested in the feminist movement and she decided to call the feminist movement to go with her at the trial. And so this was the first public trial because back then trials for rape were uh, behind closed doors because we don't have to offend the public morality and decency by retelling what happened. And so by putting that trial public Every woman, and also uh, the public television recorded it and mm, put it on uh, uh, TV, so every woman, woman in the country, but also every man, uh, realized what happened to a woman that is uh, the victim of rape. So, uh, as you can imagine, uh, questioning her own life, uh, asking how she was dressed, 
uh, why she was out uh, late in the afternoon, uh, if she, uh, it's very, very horrible, but how uh, were her harms? She tried to fight back. She said something. Did the uh, rapist really understand that she was saying no? Why she was uh, frozen? So, so on and so forth. And uh, the trial ended with uh, the condemn of the rapist, luckily. But what was also, also interesting is that for the first time, the feminist movement received a compensation money that they never collected because they were not a formal association. But the trial, the court recognized that there is, um, because of that idea that the public morality were, was offended, there is like a fight back of this horrible idea that the public must be uh, re refunded for what happened. So the idea that having open trials, open courts for rape was really, really important for the feminist movement back then because it was like a sort of control of, of what, what was happening. Uh, so that law never uh, passed. <laughs> they tried again in the 80s, in 1987, with a reform bill pretty much the same, but what was interesting that was presented by a group of senators, women senators, of different political parties that uh, join forces to try to uh, change um, the law. Uh, and then in 1995 was presented this last reform bill that is more or less the same with some different um, idea uh, that was finally uh, accepted. Uh, and so they changed the law. An important part of the law that was not in the original reform bill is that it made legal sex for minors between 13 and 16 years old uh, between each other, so people that are 13 with people that are under 16 uh, years old. That previous was illegal, in the legal age of consent was 16 years old. And this was again a very controversial point because for uh, the, the, the right wing part of, but not only in the Catholic part, of the parliament was like a uh, effort to promote sex at a young age, that it's something that we uh, don't want. Um, so, um, really, what is interesting here is the debate again that for 20 years uh, really um, moved the feminist movement. In what sense? Because there, as Vicky said, there were different souls of the feminist movement in Italy, and if some parts were linked to associations and political parties and the idea of promoting laws, a lot, a very big part was really against the basic idea that there could ever be a law that is favorable to women. So the idea is that the legal system is so patriarchal, so shaped by the um, uh, male gaze and the male subjectivity that every law made in this kind of context, so before a feminist revolution, will be a law that, with some risk for women. And for instance, in this great reform bill, the idea of mandatory persecution that could be uh, problematic. And also the idea that if you write a law, you have to define what rape is and so that you will leave behind some maybe uh, other acts or feelings or situation that you cannot imagine when you are writing the law and that can be perceived as rape by women. So there is this idea that there is no law for, that is a women's law. Uh, and also there is an anti-institutionalism very strong in all the extra-parliamentary um, left and also in the feminist movement. So again, the idea that parliament were not the place in which to uh, fight your battles and that you have to change the culture and the society more than the laws and that fighting for changing the laws is like you know uh, wasting your time in some sense. And so were a very strong uh, debate and also about the problem of open trials because they were asking themselves if court and trials can be a political arena. That was something that in Italy was debated very much because of 
old um, trials for terrorism, for instance, in which the people involved use the court as a place in which to state their political uh, views and also feminists do in some sense the same thing but the problem is, is that the correct place and also if we have to enter the court the courts we have to be uh, recognizable by the law so becoming an association a part is something that as Vicky said was something the feminist movement really does not want to do because it is involved an organization that is perceived as hierarchical and too squared for feminism. But what is interesting is that these uh, changes of the law, of the great law, uh, it's really, was really relevant to put in the debate the uh, sexual violence and domestic violence and gender-based violence in the Italian case. So the first uh, refugee centers for women, that in Italy is called CAF, uh, anti-violence center, centri anti-violenza, was opened in Milan in 1985, and it was a settlement and um, at the very first moment occupied place, um, in which they provide help for women that want to escape from situation of violence, uh, both sexual violence and domestic violence. And now they are recognized by the state. Uh, there are many of them, uh, always uh, to very less for the need of the population. Um, but what is interesting is that they started uh, by putting violence at the center of their political discourse, something that was not uh, so present in the 70s. So uh, in the 80s, the violence became a, an issue, a strong issue, and now it's also nowadays. So I will just briefly uh, arrive in the 21st century, <laughs> uh, because of course all these kind of roots really shape the feminist movement also. Uh, now, one, interest, one very relevant thing to say is that at one point there is, as I said, this problem of dividing the feminist movement, for instance, lesbian um, uh, subjectivities and demands were really a theme of discussion and debate in the 80s because for part of the feminist movement, the lesbian issues divided the movement. And also for part of the lesbian movement, some of the feminist issues were not relevant because they perceived themselves as out of the patriarchal relation with men. If you ever read Monique Wittig, like the lesbian is not a woman, it's in this kind of idea so that you are free from the relationship with men because you give a shit of what they think about you because you love women. Um, and so that was a relevant point in the 80s and in the 90s it, uh, it was created Archi Lesbica, that is the first lesbian association, that it was part of Archi Gay, that it was the first homosexual association, not the first, but the first as really as uh, recognized as an association, but then the lesbian decided that gay men were too patriarchal to join forces and created their own association. And also in 1982, in Italy, was uh, uh, created the law, uh, the first law that recognized some kind of rights to transsexual people, that it's a very controversial law, uh, because it allows the change of uh, documents, basically. Uh, but just, just if you do your uh, surgical operation to change your body and your genitalia. And uh, now it's a bit in 2015, 2015 uh, the constitutional law uh, allowed some transgender people to have the change of the documents even uh, without the surgical operation, but for many years it was like this. And what is interesting though is that, is that this transsexual law was uh, voted and approved by all the parliament, even the uh, hair of the fascist movement, so the Movimento Sociale Italiano. Why? Because this law recreates order. So, what kind of order that you don't have people looking like male showing off documents that say that they were called Lotta. 
and you have uh, women uh, that do, does not have male documents. So it recreates some kind of order, an order made on genitalia, though. So you have to have the correct uh, reproductive, not reproductive, but genital uh, organ. And so it was a victory for a lot of the trans gender movement of Italy because recognized the existence of these people, but also a very big uh, loss because it creates the possibility for just a very tiny sector of that population to add uh, recognition. So all these kind of things really uh, shaped the feminist movement in the 90s that were a bit more you know, silent, I would say, and then in uh, the first year of the uh, 21st century. Again, we have uh, some mass mobilization. The first one, the, the biggest one uh, that I recollect uh, was in 2007 in Rome. Uh, that was a um, very big march against violence, but with a, a, against gender-based violence and sexual violence, but with a very interesting claim. Uh, no sexism, no racism. Why? Because just a few months, a few weeks before the 25th of November, uh, a woman in Rome, Giovanna Reggiani, was raped and killed by a man uh, that then uh, was caught and uh, was um, a stranger guy. So uh, not Italian, whatever that means. And this led to a strong campaign of right-wing parties against this uh, foreigner man that came here and raped our women, women and that uh, really uh, put in danger our uh, civilization and that are a danger for the society. You see, they would not uh, let our women be free and so we have to fight back. And so the feminist movement really uh, recollect to say, not in our name, so uh, we are with the women that are raped, and we tell you that first, 90% of violence happens in families, so mm, no stranger in the dark night, but also that we don't want that our uh, rights will be used to uh, you know, deny rights to other people. And so it was an interesting turning point, because um, it was a moment in which the feminist movement reflect uh, upon themselves and also upon the conquest that we had and say, okay, we don't want that this uh, victory will be used to uh, narrow the rights for other people. And what is interesting here is also that the, in these years arise the problem of work so much because, yes, women can now uh, go in every kind of uh, job that they want, uh, still this employment, unemployment rate for women in Italy is very high. But what kind of work do we have? Precarious work. So precarity would, became a feminist issue in what sense? In the sense, of, in two double sense. The first one that uh, women are more employed in precarious work still nowadays. So uh, are more employed in unsafe and uncertain kind of jobs, uh, less paid also, we have to say, that does not allow you to have, for instance, a pension, okay, no one of my generation will ever have a pension in Italy, but still, uh, if you have had just precarious work, it's more unlikely, and also that this, um, it's pretty difficult for women to achieve uh, economic independence though, and so to decide for their own life. And so this became a very strong issue, and very quick I will arrive more near in our days. Um, also the issue of abortion and reproduction was really strong, because as Vicky said, now that we have the law, it's still there, uh, great, but in the law there is a, a very sneaky point, that is that the law uh, permits uh, conscious uh, objection. So doctors can say that out of their values and beliefs, they will not perform abortion, even, so the, the, this point was made for doctors that were, that have studied before 
1978, so before the abortion law, and I could rightly claim that they would not perform abortion because they didn't know that they had to do it when they studied gynecology, but now it's pretty silly, but the problem is that in Italy the rate of uh, doctors that object to abortion is 70%. And so you can imagine that this put abortion rights at risk, really. Uh, in Milan, there are mm, one uh, hospital in Guadalajara that has just three doctors that go to abortion, and Milan is quite a big city. So uh, you have to imagine how, how this is difficult. And so a lot of women decided to start to fight for a full abortion. Rights also because uh, we had some problems with <laughs> pharmacological abortion. Uh, just two years ago, uh, they decide, the, the parliament decided that we can add pharmacological abortion until the ninth week, as the uh, organization of health says that it's possible because before it was just until the sixth week of pregnancy that it's basically impossible that you will have it because in the time that you recognize that you are pregnant and that you find a doctor that will sign you a certificate, it's done. Uh, so, this is one of the main um, issues now, still now. And also, again, the theme of violence. And in 2015, uh, arise the other big movement that we saw, that it's Non Una Di Meno, that takes its name, its name from uh, Argentina, from Ni Una Menos. Uh, it's precisely the translation, not one less. Uh, after a very horrible femicide that happens yes, again in Rome, uh, uh, this, one, this time was a very young girl that was killed and burned by a boyfriend. Uh, so, pretty horrible. And this uh, gave birth to this kind of movement that said no more. But what is interesting is that they decide, again, coming from South America to use the strike as a political tool to fight. Why is interesting? Uh, you asked about the mm -hmm. workers mm -hmm. and yeah. Why is interesting? Because the strike was normally uh, perceived as a workers' tool for battle and not as a feminist uh, way to uh, do political battle. But in Italy, what is interesting that is that in the 70s there is another. A uh, stream of feminist movement that is the groups that g gather around the claim wages for or against, it depends, uh, housework, where mm, movements and groups uh, very linked to uh, left wing movements that claim a very basic thing domestic work is work and should be paid. <laughs> Uh, why? Because, uh, and they claim we are all housewives. Even the, most of them, they were workers in factories that say, when we go home, we have to uh, do laundry, prepare food, take care of the children. So we are all housewives and we need compensation for what we do. And they use the strike as a, a fight, a way to fight, and also an interesting are uh, all kind of strikes, so strike from uh, domestic work, it's pretty difficult to, you know, see, but also sexual strike, because they say, remember, sex as a duty in marriage, so sex is work in marriage, because we have to perform it, and so we stop. Um, they, say they have this beautiful claim. Uh, they call frigidity, we call it absenteeism. Uh, so, um, they use this kind of uh, political tool, and it's interesting that nowadays this kind of uh, genealogy is reinforced and recuperated by young uh, feminists. Again, to uh, say that uh, work that we perform to take care of other people is work, and that still it's mostly on women's shoulder, uh, also because how women are educated, how society is shaped, and also that this is also based on the violence. Why? Because this uh, really uh, help the society to not let women free because they don't have time, basically, to think and to 
do what they want. And so, uh, Nora Dimeno created a plan against gender violence that sees uh, how violence is structural in the society and how violence is used to uh, put women at their place. Uh, all kind of violence, from catcalling to femicide. It's like a continuum. Uh, and what is interesting is that uh, Nora Dimeno called herself, itself, trans-feminist because they try to create links and alliances uh, with uh, LGBTQI plus groups and movements that were uh, already part of the movement in Italy but that have uh, had with feminist movement some kind of interaction but not so much. And this is also something that is new but not new because as you see it's really rooted in that kind of history. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that this kind of idea of strike was really new, but at the same time, I mean, in some sense, old, but it was something that was uh, really recuperated from uh, the past to try to uh, highlight how, even if the laws now, in some sense, help us, we have a lot of work uh, to do. And yeah, my time is done. <laughs> Thank you. Not in our name, not all the feminist movement. So we have also to 
uh, be honest and say that there are different feminist movements that ask for different things nowadays due to this long history that really uh, grow in different directions. So the first thing is trying to build alliances with, uh, first of all, migrant women, of course, that it's very difficult because uh, uh, Italy is most, so as strange, a migration history, but um, women arrive as we said, or for perform domestic uh, work from different countries uh, of, of Europe and not only, or arrives men to work in the fields, in factories, in construction work, and then they bring women with, uh, with them, and women have less uh, opportunity to work, and also the women that perform domestic work to uh, go outside in the public. So if you work in a home, you just met the family you work with, and you don't have much time to work, to go outside. So it's pretty difficult to join this connection also because to you can language difficulties, of course. So this is the first effort, to try to build relationship. And then also to combine forces. Um, today or tomorrow? Today, there is a um, demonstration in Rome for mm -hmm. um, migrant rights. And the family, no, 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 really joined the, not only joined the march, but also um, rights, for instance, some things to highlight how gender lenses can help to uh, uh, understand uh, migrant situation. But also, there is the big, big problem of um, adding, uh, you know, relationship with the LGBT movement, that it's not so easy at it. As I presented, maybe <laughs> uh, now in Italy there is a strong, as in all Europe, I would say there is quite a strong debate about uh, surrogacy, in mm -hmm. uh, which uh, so now the Democratic Party elected the, its first female secretary uh, in history, <laughs> uh, and so a group of feminists decided to write an open letter to an line that it's. Uh, Secretary of the Democratic Party to ask her to condemn surrogacy and to sign a law that we uh, grant surrogacy an international crime. And then another group of feminists respond to another open letter starting from a feminist point of view saying that legalization is never um, a solution. But this was also inserted in a fight back against homosexual rights. So in Italy, um, uh, homosexual rights is not a Strong thing, so we just had in 2016 um, the right to what is called Unioni Civili, that it's not marriage, and the parliament has stated very clear that it's not marriage, but it's union between four same sex couples and only four same sex couples. So we have two different uh, kinds of contracts one is marriage for heterosexual couple, and one is this Unioni Civili for. Since it's like, oh, that is one, just one interesting thing, that it does not require you to be faithful. And that maybe would be a good thing. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> because in marriage, you have to sign that it will be in Italian. Uh, but, so it's very new. But in this law, there were a great fight, a strong fight, to step child adoption that is really relevant for a same sex couple. Because in Italy now, it's very difficult for the other parent, not the biological one to uh, whatever that means to have their son or daughter recognize it's a very long procedure that uh, really put these people these children uh, at stake for many years they cannot travel with one of the parents for instance because they, they there is no actual relationship but but this was really intertwined with the debate about surrogacy and so for instance uh, even in, in all if in Italy as all over the majority of the couples that use surrogacy are heterosexual couples. Uh, it seemed in the Italian debate that just a uh, same sex male couple we use it and so it really uh, was a, a fracture in the relationship between uh, gay movement and feminist movement because it's part of the feminist movement says uh, this is a universal crime and part of the movement's 
say we want recognition for our children, it's a bit difficult. And also the strong debate is that links class and um, gender is about prostitution or sex work. Again, a hot topic. Uh, but uh, in which uh, there are some, uh, the, in 1981 was created in Italy um, the uh, Committee for the Rights of Prostitutes by two sex workers. Uh, and Carlano, uh, active in Friuli, that is a region in the northeast, uh, that claim that they have right. Well, so <laughs> pretty easy. Uh, but that this led to another strong fracture in the feminist movement. So they consider themselves themselves part of the feminist movement, but part of the feminist movement that does not recognize this association as part of their um, and still it's a thing nowadays. I don't know if I can answer your question, yeah. but it's, it's pretty pragmatic because there are different strains of feminism that have different relationship with all these kind of issues. But for at least the Manuel there is this try to um, be intersectional. It's not so easy, so if you see the demonstration, for instance, it's very intersectional. You see people from very different uh, backgrounds, uh, sexual orientation, gender, and so on. But if you go to the meetings and the assembly, it's pretty much uh, white women. Yeah. Uh, because still, uh, due to political activity, it's still a privilege in Italy. You have to have time, uh, you have to have money to move, you have to be in a city, mostly. So, uh, and Italy is mostly made by small villages, not very well connected one with another, and so it's it's a process, I would say. Yeah, you totally answered my question. <laughs> now I have more questions. <laughs> 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 but it's good thing. So I'm from Romania, a country where people tend to think that we don't need feminists because we have one of the smallest gender pay gap in Europe after Luxembourg, which is great, but we mainly can blame this to communism, not to uh, an equalitarian society. So uh, I wanted to ask you, because, for example, in your government, from 25 people, you now we have two women, what do you think about gender pay gaps? So, no, um, no, no, about gender pay gaps and um, quotas. Okay, quotas. So in Italy now, uh, it, quota are uh, used because uh, until the introduction of uh, uh, this mandatory number of women that you have to put in the list, the, the Italian uh, parliament has just the 8% of women and so, um, that's it. oh, okay, uh, and so it was, yeah, uh, one thing and now, for instance, we just uh, voted for the region in Italy and you have to vote one man and one woman. Uh, so th this does not really resolve the thing, because as you can see in Italy, we have a um, uh, female prime minister that uh, the very first day of her uh, election is asked her to be called Il Presidente del Consiglio, that is, the, no, I cannot translate, because in Italy has this strong sex and gender division even in the language, like Spanish for instance, um, so it's uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, we say. can say <laughs> okay. that it's pretty silly because she's a woman, but still, uh, and, and lead to a lot of meme about transgender rights, of course. <laughs> uh, but um, what is so the quotas? I think, uh, and that was also a strong debate in the Italian feminist movement in the nineties. Very strong, very uh, divisive. <laughs> Uh, because for part of the feminist movement was the only tool to change the situation and to start having some women that can change the laws, that can possibly do uh, good things for women. Uh, for another part of the movement, again, was in some sense patronizing women and uh, not changing the culture, uh, but just change, uh, impose women by law. And then also for another part of the feminist movement, it's not, 
it's not just that you have to be a woman, you have to be feminist, and so it's not relevant how many women do we have in Parliament if they do nothing for women's rights. So it's not a problem of uh, what your body is or your gender identity, but what you do. And so that quotas does not say anything about what kind of politics these women will perform. So it's still a big uh, debate, and I think that in one sense, it was useful to highlight how um, politics were, was made centered and how difficult it was for the parties to find women. Really, at one point, it was funny, they were searching for women, and they said, mm -hmm. yeah, women all over. Uh, and, but also, how this protest does not really change the structure of political parties, because as I said, the more big left wing party in Italy, Partito Democratic Party, just now uh, is first female secretary. So, mm, 20, no, more. More, mm. yeah, there. No, currently, yeah. so, you know, mm. I don't know, but a lot of years. Let me check. <laughs> yeah, in Italy, left wing parties change name very often, and they yeah, don't yeah, very <laughs> often, so we do not really recollect when they were born, but still, and uh, no other party had uh, a female uh, had master of work, uh, how they called. So it's interesting to see that even if women are uh, more represented, they will not really align in a position of power, and when they do, it's just because they deny women's rights. So it's controversial. And also, gender pay gap is interesting because also Italy, oh, so Italy is not mm, very good at this point, and it's 30% gender pay gap, but uh, it depends on how you count, mm. as always, because right wing parties say it's not true. Um, because, for instance, um, if you work in the public sector, you have the same uh, pay by law, because law in Italy said that you have to pay equal men and women, so by law, the gap should not exist. Why does it exist? Because as I said, women are more mm, mm, employed in precarious work, in short-term work, um, in part-time jobs. Uh, and this is interesting because mostly they say, but women want it. Uh, women want part-time job, and so it's a favor. And of course they want it. Why? Because care work is still uh, on the shoulder of women, so they have to take care of the children. In Italy, we have a very poor welfare state in terms of uh, caring young children, uh, very young, zero, three years, horrible. Um, and so, of course, and the, the studies show that, it, that women that have children leave work precisely in that uh, period of time and never go back. And so they want part time, that's why, because men does not have paternity leave in Italy. So now they change, they make this big announcement, we did a revolution, now you have not three days of paternity leave, you have two weeks. Oh. Yes, <laughs> big revolution. Thank you, that no one pays, so mm, it's really relevant. Um, and so, of course, there is this type of gender figure because women are employed in less paid work, but also because in the private sector, also in the private sector, you have to pay equal men and women, but you have an individual contractation <laughs> with your employer, and so no one knows. Uh, but also, even if the pay is equal, men receive more bonuses. Uh, car, phones, uh, whatever, uh, and so at, at the end they are paid more, but on the paper this does not result if you just see your paycheck. Uh, and so uh, these are two, for me, good examples on how, of course, you can change the law, but there is an inner structure of the society that still reinforces women's inferiority and oppression. <laughs> you are getting closer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the way it is.
Uh, I wanted to ask about sexual education and if there are any laws regarding that, and especially since in Romania is the first country in Europe for teenage pregnancies. <laughs> and uh, we're equal, right? <laughs> it's fantastic. Yes, it's <laughs> No. Yeah. So this is another big problem. So as Vicky said, at one point family planning center consultori were born, created by the feminist movement. So um, it was a strong victory then that they were recognized by law. And the idea also in the law, so another interesting thing uh, is that the law for abortion in Italy is not a law. So abortion is not a right in Italy. You know, by law. It's just an exception of the crime to abortion in the first three months of pregnancy or after if you, uh, you, there are very strong problems. So it's the title of the law is a law for the uh, defense of maternity. Uh, and in the law there is written that the state must do sexual education to prevent abortion. So the idea of the law is how do we prevent abortion? We have a uh, family plan in place where you can have contraception, still you have to pay, but <laughs> uh, and you have sexual education. What's the problem? That uh, until the uh, end of the 90s, um, the uh, regional uh, system provides for sexual education in school. So the um, nearest hospital or whatever sent to uh, a gynecologist or someone uh, to perform sexual education. Uh, not in every school. So it's, the problem is that the state never uh, wrote a law to how our, our create and reinforce uh, this sexual education. So it's not mandatory. But if the school makes a request, you can have it. Then they changed the uh, organization of the health system, uh, and so the regional post does not have enough money for this kind of sexual education, and so the school have to pay for it. But also, uh, they cut funding in public schools, so <laughs> the school has no funds to spend in sexual education. Uh, and so, what's the result? An interesting result that for a long period of time, the only sexual education kids receive, kids that mostly in mean, middle school that starts at 11, uh, or even in secondary schools, so in high schools at 14, that is way too late for the first uh, sexual education, but uh, from a Catholic association that provides sexual education for free. And the problem is that it was basically uh, a sexual education that presents sex as a very risky thing in which you can have diseases or pregnancy and uh, diseases all over that are horrible and that will kill you that unfortunately it could be true but it's not the only thing. Uh, and so what is the solution? Abstinence. Don't do sex. Do sex just with the person you really, 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 really love when you find it and stop. stop. <laughs> <laughs> and with that person and forever. And also there were no, no sexual education at all for other kind of sexuality that it's not heterosexual. And so for a lot of people that are not uh, heterosexual, it was very difficult to um, have information. So now we have internet very fast, but um, even when I was in high school, I had just one computer with my parents. Uh, <laughs> very, very, very slow. So, <laughs> and so uh, it was impossible for me to achieve any kind of information. And so it, uh, now, and now also Catholic uh, associations do less than mm, sexual education. So there is no sexual education at all in Italy at the moment, um, apart from some projects that are interesting but very spotted, so you have, maybe you have a, a feminist association around you that will come to your school and do sexual education, but maybe not. And what is interesting is that the Nona has created a group called School Group, very <laughs> <laughs> fantasy, uh, to go to schools to provide
provide sexual education, but the problem is that uh, they were called mostly by uh, students when they have you know, protest or where they organize their assembly. And so it's again not a process, it's just one thing that you do once, then it's better than nothing, of course. But and also very late because students have to call you and so they have to no. know <laughs> that what they so and mm, and yeah, this is uh, a problem. And now there is another big problem that sexual education it's really, really um, criticized and being problematic by a lot of anti-gender groups that are pretty strong in Italy that says that uh, sexual education is something that just the families must provide to the kids because it's something private, it's something sensitive uh, and that uh, by sexual education the state will uh, indoctrinate their children to transgenderism I don't know how is it possible but I don't know um, and so, uh, and a lot, in a lot of schools, group of parents of these groups organize and fight back when even uh, teachers try to organize some sexual education. So, it's a, again, a strong topic. And this leads, not in Italy, not so much on children pregnancy, but on a very, very, very raising of sexual disease. So um, HIV, it's raising in young uh, men, but not only uh, men, but also are coming back sexual diseases that you think were like um, extinct, like syphilis, uh, because people didn't know nothing. About <laughs>
mother of the children, and so on and so forth. Um, so they present these dramatic stories that are, of course, true, but they dramatize a bit of fathers living in the car uh, because they don't have any money to provide because their ex-wife is spending all this money in purses, you know? Uh, and these groups use for some of the new masculinities idea, for instance, that also there is uh, fragility in men, that men, uh, for instance, are more often uh, committing suicide uh, than women, uh, to, but to reinforce an anti-feminist discourse. So it's difficult for a young, for, I think for a young man in Italy now, navigate this landscape and try to uh, express himself, but also not to get caught in this kind of of men rights activist net. Um, and, but what I see sometimes going in schools and also teaching in schools is that slowly, very slowly, there are young boys that are uh, really taking effort to try to uh, present a different kind of masculinity, not just, uh, you know, in a reactive way, like, oh, uh, yeah, because this was also one of the problems, so when you talk about, for instance, femicide, and then say, but we cannot cry, and you say, come on, it's a bit a different scale of problem, mm -hmm. the fear of being killed, or the fear of being, uh, you know, bullied because you're crying, so not that it's not uh, relevant, but, uh, and, but now there are men that are become, men, young guys, that are becoming more and more involved feminist movement and I think this is a good um, thing but that arise other debates in the feminist movement whether we have to accept male or not uh, she's male uh, or not and this is still a thing because there, there is also the need for a separate moment and it's difficult to negotiate this kind of uh, different needs but I think that there are uh, Things change. Italy is particularly difficult, also because politics. You know, uh, we had Berlusconi for a long period that presented this kind of macho masculinity with all the women and parties, and still now that it's in hospital, almost <laughs> dead, uh, make jokes about how we fuck a lot of women. And say, Come on, uh, we're almost dead. Uh, but then we have Salvini that presented it himself like a good father that they take care of the children, like the father of the family, providing for the family. But a lot of family. Which are different families, so, and now we're not. <laughs> and then a woman, so, uh, not family, not so much. Um, but uh, it's, I think it's difficult because, yeah, there is still a culture that asks men to behave in a very precise way. But the uh, last thing that is also so interesting, I think the work that the, the gay movement have uh, made to try to uh, bring new kind of masculinities, and also the trans movement, even though in Italy uh, transgender issues are mostly presented as issues of and to have people, so um, transgender men are really invisible in the public debate. And this is also in terms of new masculinity. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to formulate it. Uh, first of all, I think to like, uh, block this memory about this uh, uh, sexual uh, uh, education in a uh, middle school and out of Oedipus. You know, we we'll all get Oedipus. <laughs> okay, this is another story. And, uh, I mean, uh, it was effective, you remember it. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I removed it. <laughs> But I wanted to maybe try to ask something about the uh, obsession of, uh, of conscience. Uh, because, I mean, not only like in the hospitals, but also, for example, in, uh, in pharmacies. Because we had these uh, um, examples from some years ago, if I remember well, about uh, the pharmacists uh, not wanting to uh, sell uh, the after pill uh, because of, uh, I mean, ethical reasons. So, I mean, I don't know what to ask. Just like uh, to uh, <laughs> Actually, this is illegal. So the fact is that the, the law tells that people involved in the abortion can object to it. So 
when the law was written, this was the idea of the oncologist uh, that really had to, you know, perform materially the abortion, but now it's used in a very extensive way, also for nurses that brings you in the room where the abortion is performed, anesthetists that should not uh, do it, or pharmacists, or even uh, you can do an abortion in Italy, it's pretty, a pretty uh, bureaucratic way, you have to uh, go to a doctor that could be a doctor in a family planning center or your uh, doctor of normal one, a general one, uh, and you have to have a certificate that proves that you are really pregnant. Then you have to book an appointment. Yeah, you have to do a lot of uh, things to prove that you are very, very uh, pregnant. Sorry to do for, yeah, for nothing, of course, and then you have to make an appointment and, at the hospital where you meet uh, the gynecologist that have to tell you that if you don't want to have an abortion, you cannot have it, and, that, and then you have six, seven days in which you have to think about it by law, because maybe you didn't think about it very, very deep. Uh, and then you can come back and finally maybe have uh, your abortion. And all these people can be, uh, can object. Even if the law does not say that to, you know, have your blood exam is something related to uh, the abortion, but if you want to have an abortion for ethical reasons, they object. And the problem is also that the, uh, the objection possibility was made uh, equal with the objection to the military service. But what is the difference? So the, the idea was the same. If for ethical reason I can say no to be part, be part so the military service was mandatory for male until uh, my age. Um, and so, uh, but if you don't want to go uh, in the military service, you have to spend one year, that it, one month more, basically, uh, in what is called civil service. Uh, so you can say no to uh, army, but you have to do something uh, different. Uh, if you don't want to do civil service, you go to jail. <laughs> uh, for doctors, this is not true. So you can say no to abortion, but there is nothing else you have to do. So the um, objection or break is growing. Also, because it's very, very practical, you get the same pay, you do less job, uh, because you don't have to perform abortion. And also, uh, you can change your mind. So you can be, uh, say, do abortion for 20 years and then say, I change my mind, uh, I want to object now on. And also there is the problem that the uh, hierarchies in the hospital are especially here in Lombardia, are mostly made by uh, people affiliated in some sense to the Catholic Church. And so if you don't want to have a career inside the hospital, it's better to uh, say that you don't want to perform abortion. And the result is that in Cinisello Balsamo that is nearby, my gynecologist that is now retired <laughs> man, I uh, have to go there and perform abortion because all the other doctors said no. And so it's uh, pretty also unsafe. So it's very good. I love him. But at the same time, he is now 70 years old. So maybe there's other young, younger guys. And also, one of the problems is that in med school, no one teaches you how to perform abortion and so young doctors need to go in the hospital and really look how to do it but the problem is that if you are in a hospital where everyone is conscious objective you don't have the chance to try to do it and so it's getting worse and worse and also in some hospitals in Lazio and in Puglia they try to do to hire people that will perform abortion so put it like you know, uh, a job in the job description. <laughs> uh, but then the TAB, so the tribunal, said that this was uh, non uh, rightful because it's like a form of discrimination because the, the law permits this kind 
of objection, and so there is no solution. I'm sorry, I'm sensing <laughs> that I like depressing you know, <laughs> more and more. No, it it the situation. Absolutely, <laughs> that was so powerful now. <laughs>